Well, good evening. I invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. We're going to start in Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. And while you make your way to that passage, let me thank you so very much for your presence here tonight. And uh, look forward to our study together and appreciate so very much your willingness to come out on a Monday. Hope that your week has gotten off to a good start. And uh, hopefully we'll, if that is the case, we'll do nothing to detract from that as we study together uh, this evening. Isaiah 43, uh, we're going to begin our reading in verse 10. Isaiah 43, verse 10 beginning. Isaiah writes, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no, there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior beside me. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there was no strange God among you. So you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, for I am God. There was a Jewish rabbi who was walking along the dusty trail, ran outside of the, the northern section of the uh, northern end of the Sea of Galilee, and he was reciting this passage from the book of Isaiah in an effort to commit this text to his mind and to his heart. And as he in, in concentrated intently on this scripture, uh, the sun began to go down below the horizon, and eventually he found himself traveling in the dark. He came to a fork in the trail, and rather than turning, taking the left-hand fork that would have taken him to his home, for some unknown reason, he decided that he was going to go right. It was a way that he had never traveled before. And, and so he turned uh, to the right fork in the road. And, and after several minutes of walking, he found himself standing outside of a small Roman fort that housed a garrison of soldiers. And as he approached it, out of the darkness came a voice from up on the wall. Who are you? What are you doing here? Well, at first, the rabbi was a bit startled from the voice coming out of the dark, and all he could respond was, what? The soldier repeated the questions, but this time more loudly. Who are you? What are you doing here? In response, the rabbi's voice was more confident now than in what it had been before. And he responded by asking a question of his own. What do you get paid to ask me these questions? Now it was the Roman soldier who was a bit taken back. And he paused for a few moments, and with sarcasm in his voice, he eventually answered, Three denarii a week, Jew. Why? The rabbi shouted up at the wall and said, I'll pay you double if you will stand outside my house and ask me those same two questions every morning before I leave home. Who are you? And what are you doing here? Tonight, do you know who you are? And I'm not, I'm not talking about what you may have accomplished in life. I'm not talking about you describing to me your family tree. I'm, I'm not asking for you what you may have done for a living or you're currently doing for a, a living. But, but who are you, really? Deep down, who are you? And, and, and what are you doing here? Not, not, not here in this building, but, but why are you here at all? What is, what is your meaning? What is your mission? What is your purpose? When it comes to answering those two questions, there, there are two main possibilities from which to choose. One possibility is what most folks do, and that is as they look to answer those questions, they speculate, they conjecture, they theorize, they guess, but they rarely, if ever, look beyond their own humanity. The other possibility comes not from men, but rather from divine revelation. That when it comes to our identity and our purpose, God has not left us in the dark. He, we are not left to depend upon mere speculation. And the answer that comes back is that all of us are a, a part of a story. Not, not just our own story that, 
uh, we could certainly look back and break down into various chapters of our lives, but God says we are part of something that is much bigger, that we have a role in something that is far more encompassing than just our own story. In contrast to that, as our culture increasingly drifts toward atheism, people find themselves robbed of purpose and identity. We become nothing more than a, 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 a random combination of molecules who have absolutely no reason whatsoever for our existence. As one man phrased it, we go from goo to you by way of the zoo. Back in January, I thought that was I, I, that was one of those that just sort of stuck with me over the years. Now, back in January of 2009, Richard Dawkins, he is a a very prominent atheist. He's author of the book, The God Delusion. Uh, and he teamed up with the British Humanist Society. They raised a significant amount of money. And what they did was they purchased some advertising that was to be put on the sides of the public buses in the United Kingdom. And the sign on those buses read, there's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Watch three observations from this. First of all, there's a key word here, isn't there? It's the word probably. Because what they're communicating by that word is that they don't know for sure. And they know they don't know for sure. They're speculating, they're guessing, they're theorizing, and it is their conviction that the odds are somewhat less than 50% that they're wrong. But what if they are wrong? A, a second observation is that this statement assumes that the people who believe in God are the miserable people on the planet, doesn't it? That they are the ones who aren't enjoying life. But studies have shown that just the opposite of that is true, that people of faith are usually less stressed, they are more content, they are happier, happier in life overall than, than other folks. But there's a third thing that we can observe from this, and that is that if this statement is true and there is no God, that then human existence emerged simply by chance. And, and therefore, there is no way to avoid the, the inevitable conclusion that you and I have no purpose and we have no real meaning at all. But the Bible declares something different, doesn't it? It declares often, and it declares it in a variety of ways, that you and I are not the result of an accident, that chance is not our creator, that, that fate is not humanity's father, that instead you and I exist because of the skill and the will of the most accomplished craftsman in the universe. And that, that our God did not just make us, but that he made us to be the objects of his love, and he made us with a specific purpose in mind. And friends, that makes each and every one of us significant and valuable. When we understand and we acknowledge that God is our maker, that he has a purpose for our lives, that we are not made for time, but rather for eternity, it alters our significance, it changes our values, it re reorders our, pri our priorities. We are transformed in regard to how we look at life. Our ability to answer these two questions, who and what, is totally dependent upon us knowing and understanding the story that we are a part of. And the nation of Israel provides us with a marvelous parallel to help us understand what that role is. That when we come to understand who they were and what they were doing here, when we see their, see and understand their story, it equips us to see more clearly who we are and what we're doing here, and therefore we can better grasp our own story. So, from Isaiah, let's turn back to the book of Exodus. I want you to turn back to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, and we're going to read the first six Verses. Exodus 19, beginning in verse 1. Exodus 19 and verse 1. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. 
when they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Now, before we look at the text, we, most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with the story that leads up to this, aren't we? And we go back in the story, and we go back to the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, and there we find God creating man and woman, Adam and Eve, uh, and they are created for fellowship with him. They walk in the garden together, but at some point in time, that relationship is fractured by sin. And not only are Adam and Eve cast out of the garden, but all of humanity follows in the footsteps, the same footsteps, the same sinful footsteps as that original pair. In fact, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, humanity has become so corrupt that God has determined that it is now necessary to wipe the entire planet clean and to start all over again, and he does so with the family of a man named Noah. From the descendants of Noah, there comes a man by the name of Abram. His name is later changed to Abraham. And God, in Genesis chapter 12, in verses 1 through 3, not only gives instruction to Abraham, leave here and go to the place I tell you, but he makes a promise to Abram and to Abram's lineage that Abram's seed, it is through Abram's seed, that divine blessing to all of the families, all of the nations of the earth will eventually be realized. Abraham gives birth to a son named Isaac. The promise is passed to him. Isaac gives birth to a son, Jacob, and the promise is passed to him. And when we conclude with the book of Genesis, what we find is that Jacob's entire family, numbering some 70 individuals, has moved from the land of Canaan to the land of Egypt in order to survive a, t a time of famine, much to the efforts of Joseph and his planning and the dreams that he had interpreted for Pharaoh. But in between the end of Genesis and the beginning of the book of Exodus, in that white space that exists in our Bibles, there are some 400 years of time that pass. And as that time passes, the descendants of Abraham have grown into a nation of people, but they are a nation of enslaved people. And yet, as the story continues, under the leadership of Moses and as a result of the plagues upon Egypt that are brought by God, God delivers Israel from her bondage. And as we pick up here in Exodus chapter 19, it is taken somewhere between one and three months for them to arrive here at Mount Sinai and understand that they will be camped out here at Mount Sinai for almost a year of time. Now, in between the Exodus and Exodus chapter 19, we are told some of the things that the Israelites are saying among themselves. And if we were in a Bible class, we would say, what would that be? And the answer would be, well, all they really did was grumble and complain about everything. But behind all of that grumbling and all of that complaining, there's an implied question. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? Because the desert was not what they bargained for. That was not what they expected when they left the land of Egypt. But they also have very little idea of who they are. Because by that, this point in the story, they have simply been an enslaved minority. They have been used and abused by a powerful nation. But they have now left Egypt, and as they come to Mount Sinai, they arrive there as the people of God. They have been chosen to play a vital role in bringing the blessings that had been promised to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12 to bring those blessings to all the nations. It is here in Mount Sinai that we find God's first 
official encounter with the nation of Israel. And here he does three things. First of all, he points them back to the past. He wants them to look backward, and there are some things that he wants them to ponder and to think about. But he also directs their mind in the opposite direction, to the future. He is going to inform them of where all of this is moving. And then third, he wants them to consider what they are to be in the present moment. Three dimensions. And so let's start with the first one. Uh, the first one involves the past grace of God's salvation. Look at verses 3 and 4. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. And understand that the words that are being communicated here to Moses are not just for Moses. They are for all of Israel. And you'll see that as well at the end of verse 6. That Moses' presence on the mountain with God is not just for Moses' own personal communion with God, but it is for the purpose of Moses receiving a message and delivering, going back down the mountain and delivering that message, that same message to the people of Israel. And the basic message of verses 3 and 4 is a simple one. I want you to remember he begins by pointing to his own actions on behalf of his people. And in verses 3 and 4, there is an extremely brief summary, if you will, of Exodus chapter 6 through Exodus chapter, chapter 19. And as God discloses himself to his people, he wants them to think back about what he had done for them in destroying Egypt in order for them to come out to himself here at Mount Sinai. Now, again, keep in mind that it has been, it's less than three months that these people have left Egypt. Prior to that, this same group of people had been whipped and beaten. They were slaves who had been exploited by a more powerful nation, and even to the extent of experiencing state-sponsored infanticide, that is the killing of their infants. Less than three months prior to this, these people were being savagely treated, and you remember in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23 through 25 that they cried out to God in the midst of their misery, and God heard their pleas. And he has now brought them out to himself as a liberated and a redeemed people. They are being welcomed into his presence. They will be offered a covenant of promise, and it's not going to come by their own efforts or their own merits but it is based on what God did for them. Now, we know what happens next in chapter 20, don't we? Because we've read ahead. And what's coming next is the giving of the law of Moses. And in particular, you'll notice in chapter 20, in the first several verses, the giving of the Ten Commandments. But understand, because 19 precedes chapter 20, you things get by me as obvious as that. That what is coming is based on what God has already done for them. And so God, when he gives to them the Ten Commandments, when he provides to them the law, their obedience to the law, their living as the people of God, is going to be founded on the grace of what God has already done in saving them in the past. That their obedience to his law it is not going to be the result of some sterile legalism. It is not going to be some blind adherence to a divine set of rules that he provides to them. It is going to be what ought to have been the very natural response in regard to the gracious deliverance that had been provided to them. And whether we're talking about Israel camped out in Mount Sinai or whether we're talking about 20 or Christians in the 21st century, everything that we do as the people of God, has to come in response to our understanding and our appreciation of everything that God has done to redeem us in the past. There are some who erroneously believe that the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that, well, those folks in the Old Testament, they were saved by keeping the law of Moses. But the people in the New Testament, because of the cross, they, they're saved by grace. The reality here is that Every person in every age that has ever lived who has been saved has been saved by the grace of God. 
In fact, look at how chapter 20 starts. This is the giving of the Ten Commandments. He says, then God spoke. This is chapter 20 and verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And it's then he starts into the giving of the law. Whatever God calls us to do in terms of his purpose for us, it must always be set within the context of what God has graciously done for us in the past. Let me give you a couple of examples from the New Testament. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 8. I'll just quote them. While we were still helpless, Paul says, Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Any response of love to God on our part must come in response to God's love that's been demonstrated for us. Demonstrated by what he has accomplished for us in the past. And so it's Israel's memory of what God had done for them. And if you look through the Old Testament, you'll find that they are constantly being reminded about the Exodus. This is what God has done for you. And it's what God did for them that should have motivated them, compelled them to, you'll notice at the beginning of verse 5, go back to chapter 19 and verse 5, to obey his voice and to keep or to guard his covenant with them. Now, for Israel, what was to compel that was a remembrance of their deliverance from Egypt. What's to compel us is our remembrance of what God did for us at the cross when Jesus was given as our as sacrifice for our sins. But notice as we move into verse 5 now, that the tense changes. There was the past tense in verse 4. Now we find the future tense in verse 5. And we find, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. God's great act of deliverance from Egypt has already been done. Now here's their, his purpose for them. As we move forward, as you look out into the future... Here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to understand. Now, you've ever been to the top of a mountain. Maybe you've been to up on top, the top of Pikes Peak in Colorado. But if you've been on the top of a mountain, it's not going to take you a lot of imagination to, to think about this illustration. From the view that God has in the story, he's up on Mount Sinai. He's able to see some things that Israel is not. Now, I understand God's omnipresent. He's not confined to a mountaintop. But in this narrative, where's God? God's at the top of the mountain. And where are the people of Israel? The people of Israel are at the foot of the mountain. And we understand from our own experiences that when you are at the foot of the mountain, your vision is extremely limited. When you are at the top of the mountain, your vision is almost unlimited. From Israel's vantage point at the foot of the mountain, they are the only people who are around. They're the only people that God has rescued. They're the only people that God has demonstrated his concern for. And God, in a sense, acknowledges some of that, that you are my special people with whom I have a covenant. In fact, you'll notice there in verse 5 that he calls them my own possession. Interesting word here in the Hebrew. It, it spoke of a personal treasure. It was a word that was sometimes used to describe royal property. Now, in the context of an absolute monarchy, the reality is that the king owns everything, and the citizens own nothing. That's the way it is in a true monarchy. But within the total ownership of the king, a king might choose to take some things that were particularly prized by him, and say, these are mine in somewhat of a unique way. That the, these belong to me in a private sense. And those, that choice that, that comes as a result of the king's own personal choice. That's the word here. But while it was true that, that in Egypt God implemented his personal choice of Israel, that they became his own possession, 
Israel was not to make the mistake of thinking that they were the only people on earth, that they were the only ones that God was concerned about. And you'll notice the wording of this. He says, among, you are my possession, among all of the peoples. Israel only sees themselves. God sees all of the other nations. You're just one among many. At the foot of the mountain, Israel might have mistakenly perceived themselves to be the only folks that were around. But up on top of the mountain, God sees all of the nations. God proclaims all of the earth belongs to me. And therefore, Israel is not to be separate from the world so that they can belong to God in, in some private sense. But they belong to God so that they can be used by God for a very special purpose. And it's here at Mount Sinai that we find that, that God's plan for world redemption really begins to, to get started in earnest. And so here in this text, we see a balance between one specific thing that's happening at Mount Sinai. It's happening with just one nation of people, the people of Israel. It's occurring at one geographic location, Mount Sinai. And yet, verse 5 reveals that there is a universal perspective that God has. That yes, God has rescued just one nation from slavery and bondage, but his purpose in the overall story as he brings them to himself is that that one event of deliverance is going to open the door to, to uh, freeing people, other people, other nations from slavery and bondage as well. I turn back just a, a few pages in the book of Exodus to chapter 9. Chapter 9. Let's see if we can bring this home as well. A little bit more clear just how there's more going on behind the scenes than just Israel. Look at Exodus chapter 9. In chapter 9 and verse 16. In chapter 9 and verse 16, uh, the Lord says this. He says, But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain. As he's addressing Pharaoh, Pharaoh of Egypt. For this reason, I've allowed you to remain in order to show my power and in order to proclaim my name throughout all the earth. Why did God let Pharaoh stay in place? Why didn't he, why didn't he just take him out of the way? And God's answer is, I want to use you. I'm using you to show my power and to, so I can proclaim my name throughout all of the earth. Now, you stop and you think about, if you're familiar with the account of Rahab in Joshua chapter 2. Forty years later, so 40 years after what we're reading in Exodus chapter 19, there is a woman in the city of Jericho. It's going to be the first city of conquest as the Israelites cross the Jordan River under the leadership of Joshua. And she tells the spies that come to her house, she recounts to them the Exodus. She knew about the Exodus. She just heard it by news that traveled around. And by what she heard about Israel's God and the account of the Exodus, she came to believe in God. So much so that she would be the only ones, her and her family, going to be the only ones saved out of the entire city of Jericho. Now, that's a 40-year span. So she remembers an event that happened 40 years ago, and she bases her faith on what she heard. Let's, let's, let's make this even more dramatic. Over in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 4 and verse 8, the Philistines and the Israelites are doing battle, and the Israelites decide that they're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the camp. They were defeated in, the, in round one. What we need is we need the Ark. And so they have uh, the, the priests come out there, and they bring the Ark of God out there. And when the Ark of the Covenant comes into camp, there's this great shouting and joy, and the Philistines hear it. And in verse 8, they understand this is the God who destroyed Egypt. So now we fast forwarded a few hundred years. And yet the Philistines, they are familiar with the Exodus. They're familiar with what God did to Egypt. And so God says, look, I've got a purpose for you, Pharaoh. I, I, I am going to use you to show my power and to proclaim my name throughout the earth. And that name that he proclaimed went 40 years into the future, and Rahab knows about it. It goes hundreds of years into the future, and even the Philistines know about it. That even though God is acting with just one group of people at Mount Sinai, 
His purpose for them, his agenda for them, is much larger than just what we're reading about in Exodus chapter 19. This is the nation of people that God desires to use to bring his blessing and his salvation to a host of other folks. Now, it's true that when you read through the rest of the Old Testament, that the, the, the frame of the camera, if you will, is typically filled with Israel. And it's only briefly that you see other nations that enter into the frame of the camera. These are his chosen people. These are the ones that he has chosen to have a close relationship with. They are his special focus, but they have a purpose. And that purpose is something that involves all of the nations, that there is something that they are a part of that's much bigger than just themselves. God's plan is to use them to bring blessing to all of the nations of the earth. And when they're camped out at Mount Sinai, the nation of Israel doesn't even have a clue about that yet. Who are you? And what are you doing here? We are the people of God. We have been redeemed and delivered and saved. For the nation of Israel, it was their exodus from their bondage in Egypt. For us today as Christians, it's our deliverance from sin as a result of the cross of Jesus Christ. God pointed Israel back to the Exodus and said, you've seen what I've done. For us, he points us back to the cross. And he says, you've seen what I have done for you. You, you have witnessed, you have experienced all that I've done to bring you into a unique relationship with myself. But understand that I've done that for a reason. I have done that for a purpose. I have saved you for the sake of others. God hasn't saved us just so we get to be the only folks that go to heaven. He has saved and he has chosen us so that we can become the means by which God is able to save others. In other words, you and I, we have an eternal purpose. And that is significant. That gives us meaning. Who are you? What are you doing here? The third element, go back to Exodus chapter 19 now. The third element that we see in the text is the present grace of God's people. So we have... We have God's people living in God's world to fulfill God's purpose. Verse 6. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. That's who Israel was. That's what they were doing here. And that's who they were supposed to be. They were a covenant group of people who were not just kingdoms, uh, citizens of a kingdom... You'll notice how they're described here. They are described as a kingdom of priests. Understand that the priesthood of Israel, that you and I are most often familiar with, the tribe of Levi and the line of Moses and Aaron, that hasn't even been established in Israel yet. God at Mount Sinai speaks to the manner that he intends to use this nation with regard to all of the rest of the nations of the earth. He says, you will be my priests. You will be my middleman. A priest was someone who stood between God on one hand and men on the other hand. And those priests, by standing in the middle, functioned in both directions. And so on the one hand, it was the priest's job to teach the law of God to the people. It was through the priest that God's person and character and will was to be communicated and made known to the people of Israel. And of course, it would be a role that Israel's priests would oftentimes fail and fail miserably. But there's another direction as well, and that is that the priests were also charged with bringing the sacrifices of the people before God. And so whether it was due to some sin or some uncleanness on your part, you would have been prohibited from coming into God's presence in the assembly of his people. And so you would bring an animal. You would present that animal to the priest to be sacrificed. It would be sacrificed as the law prescribed. If it was a sin offering, you would confess your sin over the animal. You would put your head on the or hand on the head of the animal as its throat was cut, 
And as you stood and watched, it, the blood would be poured out on the altar. And when the blood was offered in keeping with the law, the priest would declare that your sin had been atoned for. And therefore, you were once again allowed to come back into God's presence in the assembly and have fellowship with him and with his people. But you'll notice that the entire nation of Israel is commissioned here to be a kingdom of priests. By the way, that's the, it's, this is the only time in the entire in the entire Bible, where we find this particular phrase. God says to the nation of Israel as a whole, not just the tribe of Levi, as a whole, you will be for me what your priests will be for you. Except you will do it for the rest of the nations. You are going to be my middlemen. You are going to be the people through whom I'm going to reveal myself to the world. Now, that same role has been charged to us as his people in the world today. That you and I are to be the middlemen. We are the ones who are to be the vehicle by which a knowledge of God is brought to other people, and as a result of that, other people are then brought to God. We stand as his representatives. And if you don't believe that, let me just read to you a passage from the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Isn't it interesting that the text that Peter quotes from there is a passage that we've just read, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6. Now, if you go back to Exodus chapter 19, how is Israel going to accomplish that? How are they going to pull this off? And the answer to that question is found there in verse 6. It is going to be as a result of them becoming a holy nation. Israel is just one nation on the planet, but even though they make up just one group of people, they are God's royal property. They are set apart. They are distinct from all of the other nations, but not to be separate in terms of being isolated from everybody. But instead, they have been commissioned to share God's person and God's truth and thus bring nations to a knowledge of God. And how are they going to do that? By displaying the divine nature. By living in the likeness of their Savior. That's how they will show their God to the other nations around them. Look, look if you would, at chapter 20. In chapter 20, in verse 4, what's the first commandment? What's the second commandment? You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. They're not to have any kind of image. They're not to have something that they can point to and say, there's, there's our God. Now, I want to tie this together. Look back at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Notice what God declares in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. There he says... Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. You know why Israel wasn't supposed to have gods that they could point to? Why they weren't supposed to be graven images? Because they were to be the image. They were to be the image. That when the other nations looked at them, they saw the image of God what God had originally planned back in Genesis chapter 1. It, now, admittedly, Israel is going to fail miserably to live up to that high calling. They will instead choose to disobey God's will for them, and thus rather than bringing glory to their Savior, they will instead bring reproach upon him. They will become an object of ridicule among the nations. That rather than seeking to live distinctively among the nations in order to draw people to their God, they instead rejected God. They wanted to live just like all of the other nations around them, and as a result, the nations became even less attracted to Israel's God than they might have been otherwise. And don't miss the point here. That Israel's disobedience to the covenant requirements had implications that went far beyond just their own personal relationships with God. Their failure had significant ramifications in regard to the outworking of God's redemptive plan for the world. 
It would be by obeying God's voice, verse 5, that they would become a different kind of people because they served a different kind of God. And God says to them, if you're going to be the people that belong to me, it demands that you live in a unique way. And when you begin to live that way, now you can be something for me in the world. You see the parallel? That's what we've been called to visit. How, how do we influence people? How do we show people God? By how we behave. Let's close. We'll come full circle with the passage that Jim read earlier. Matthew chapter 5. Turn over to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. As we draw the lesson to a close. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Matthew 5 and verse 13. For most of us, this is very familiar territory, isn't it? And yet so... So simple, and yet so very convicting. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. It's not just our belief system that's important. It's our behavior that's important. And our behavior may not, perhaps it can be argued, it's not the most important thing, but it is the most visible thing by which we're able to distinguish ourselves from people who do not have new life in Christ. That what is required of us because we are saved is that we adhere to a high moral standard of thought and action, and in the process we show the world how life as God designed it was to be lived. That's our purpose. That's what Paul's talking about when he says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 to walk in a manner that is worthy of your calling. What's our calling? To let our light shine before men in such a way that men may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. The clearest proof of God's existence is not some logical scintillating argument. It, it, it's not some forceful rhetoric. Instead, it is a pure, humble, godly life that's lived daily in the shadow of the cross and in the brilliance of his resurrection. So that when atheists put a placard on the side of a bus that says there probably is no God, that it should bring a response from other people, even unbelievers, who say, you know what, I, I don't think that can be true. Because I know Daryl, and, and I know Audrey, I know Bobby, I know Wilma, and, and they're Christians. And it's very clear to me that, that God is real in their lives. They are the living proof that there is a living God. Who are you? What are you doing here? We're just like Israel, aren't we? We have experienced the past grace of God in salvation. And as a result, we are, we are redeemed, and now God seeks to use us to fulfill his purpose in bringing others to a knowledge of him. And how are we going to do that? Just like the nation of Israel. We are called to live in the present in response to that grace. To live differently in every facet of our existence as the representatives of God, as children of the King. So that the world may see that there is a living God. And that they too might come to love and to worship and to serve Him. Tonight you need to obey the gospel of Jesus. There is no better time than right now 
Now is what you have. That's where life is found. That's where meaning and purpose is discovered. That's what God's created us for. He created us in his image. And we've made a horrible mess of that, haven't we? But in Christ, we can be renewed. And we can begin to restore that image so that as others look at us, they see our God living in us. We can help you to obey the gospel of Jesus tonight. No better time than now. Won't you come? Why don't you stand?